All right. Now, as many of you know, if you're here this morning, you know what we're going to be preaching on tonight. And the sermon this morning is, is this sermon this evening is really just a continuation of what I was preaching this morning. And what I was preaching on this morning is just, you know, how Jesus Christ is the, the most expensive gift, the most precious gift, the best gift ever given in the entire world is the gift of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning we, I taught a lot and we looked at a lot of scriptures about all the suffering that Jesus went through. And, and there's, I mean, and it's, and it's just a, a very, very tip of the iceberg of what we covered this morning when you consider the entire life of Jesus Christ and everything that he did. I mean, day after day, living that perfect life, going through every element of his arrest and his conviction and, and the, the, everything he went through on the cross, just, just every moment, there, there's so much there. And I can't state it enough, you know, how grateful we need to be for that precious gift. But where I left off this morning, and the reason why I left off is because there was just not enough time to continue and go into everything in enough detail that I want to go into it, is that when Jesus Christ, after he suffered physically and went through everything he went through and, and, and shedding his blood and being crucified and dying on the cross, that's not the end of his sacrifice that he made was not just left on the cross. His sacrifice continued on beyond the cross. The, the, the payment that was being made for our sins continued beyond the cross. And, and one of the things that the points I left off on that a lot of people will turn to when, when dealing with this subject, and just to get it out there, you know, I believe that the Bible very, very clearly teaches that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell and that when the Bible talks about hell, it's never, ever one time referenced as a positive place or even as a neutral place. It is never once a place that anyone would ever want to be all throughout the Bible. It's very consistent. It is not a good place to be ever at all. So when Jesus Christ's soul went to hell, it was not there to pay a visit. Jesus bare the sins of the whole world in his own body. He was crucified on the tree. He came to pay the punishment for our sins. The punishment for our sins is hell. Amen. That, that's what it is. If you die without Christ, because of your sins, you go to hell. And Jesus came to pay for our sins. Guess what he did? He paid for our sins in hell. I'm going to prove that to you tonight. Now, there is an opposing view brought forth by other Bible believers. I don't care what other people teach and believe that are not saved, but there are people that I know that are saved that are wrong on this doctrine. And what they teach is this concept, and I'm going to go a little bit into this, but I'm going to spend the majority of my time just going over the scripture, just teaches what it teaches. Not spending as much time debunking what other people think or believe, because what really matters is just what does the Bible actually say? Let's just go with what the Bible says. And we could really go into multiple whole length sermons debunking all of the reasons why what they believe is false. And what they believe is that when Jesus died, when it says he went soul into hell, he didn't actually go to like the burning fiery part and like was suffering. So one of the things that people have a big problem with is when you say that Jesus Christ's soul suffered in hell. You have to admit that it went to hell because we're going to get to that in a minute. The Bible is very clear that his soul went to hell. No doubt about it. But people say, oh, you can't believe he suffered in hell. Yes, I can, because everybody that goes to hell suffers in hell. Right. I mean, that's what hell is. And I'll, I'll cover some of the, the verses that people get confused by. But basically what the other notion is out there, the other teaching is that when he died, he went to, this, to paradise. He went to Abraham's bosom, is what some people will say. They'll, that's what they'll call it. This, this compartment of hell that is not a torturous car, but that's where the Old Testament saints went before Jesus rose again from the dead. And then when Jesus rose again from the dead, then all of the Old Testament saints, all those that were saved beforehand, all transported up into heaven. 
That is very easily debunked. We have examples of two people in the Old Testament that we know for a fact went to heaven. Elijah, one of them, went to heaven by a whirlwind in a chariot. Okay, he, was, he was literally went up into heaven. And we know that Enoch was, was no more when he was translated and he walked with God. Okay, and what, uh, what more do you need? Paradise, and we could go through, I've done this in the past in other sermons, there's three references to the word paradise. You're never going to find any mention of paradise being in hell. In fact, all, all you're going to find if you look in, into history is, is a quote from Adolf Hitler saying that, you know, and I forget what the quote is, but, but basically if you, if you repeat a lie you know, often enough, you could get people to believe that, that paradise is in hell or hell is paradise or something like that. And I don't remember the exact quote, but I think it's just kind of interesting that he's got this quote out there that, that basically can sum up what believers are teaching about hell. Now, I didn't care to get that quote perfect because that's not, that's not what I'm relying on as my proof, okay, for, for why their doctrine is false. I just thought it was kind of interesting to throw it out there. But what do we see here? Let's get started. You know, when people say, one of the first things they'll say is, well, Jesus Christ was on the cross and it is finished. Right? And then they start applying what he meant by that to say, see, well, since he said it was finished, that just means everything we need for salvation was finished. No. Now, when you, when you look at, did he make that statement? Absolutely, he made that statement. Now, what does it mean? That's not quite as clear. And what we're going to be basing our doctrine on things that we can point to and, and say for a fact, this is true. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about this. I believe what I believe about what he said, what he meant when he said it is finished. But again, that's not, you know, I'm not going to turn to that one statement to prove that, well, well, soul went to, went to hell because he said it is finished. No. Well, I believe he did, when he said it was finished, everything he had to do on this earth, like his earthly ministry, was finished. All the prophecies that needed to be fulfilled to that point while he was alive was fulfilled. But not all the prophecy was fulfilled because he didn't rise again from the dead. The resurrection is kind of a key point in our salvation. And see, we don't want to neglect any part of what Jesus did. I don't think we should neglect any of it because we can't neglect the blood. Is the blood important? Yeah, you better believe the blood is important. But is the blood everything? No. The blood's not everything, but the blood is that you can't, you can't have salvation without the blood. But you also can't have salvation without the resurrection. Yeah, I mean, that's our hope, right? And think about all the verses that could just go through your head on, on the resurrection and, and our hope of eternal glory and, you know, regarding salvation. Same thing with the blood. Well, his death on the cross was important too. And so was his descent into hell. And I'm going to prove that to you. We're going to look at the verses and I'm going to show you from Scripture that there should be no reason to have confusion on this doctrine at all. But we need to look at the Bible and, just, and it's not just one place. When I prepare for these sermons, I remember the last time I preached on this at Word of Truth years ago. And I remember kicking myself thinking like, oh, how could I have left this out of the sermon? Because there's so much that you can turn to. This isn't just some one-off thing. This isn't some little thing where it's like, oh yeah, this verse here and that verse there, and that's what proves our doctrine. No, this is all throughout Scripture. Literally, there's so many places you can turn to to prove what we believe right, and what I'm going to teach tonight right, and the other nonsense about this paradise and Abraham's bosom, false. There, there, there's so much uh, in Scripture. But we're in Ephesians chapter 4, Let's see this reference to the resurrection showing the importance not only of the resurrection, because the resurrection is extremely important. Jesus' ascension, his resurrection, extremely important, but also his descending. Look at verse number eight. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? 
who he's saying, okay, he ascended, but what is it? What really is this, uh, the, the, the fact that he ascended, except that he ascended from the lower parts of the earth? Like, that's where he came up from. The lower parts of the earth, by the way, is not six feet under. It's not in a cave with a, with a stone rolled over it. That's not the lower parts of the earth. You read all throughout Scripture, the nether. Nether just means lower. Look up the word nether. Look up the word lower parts. It's always going to be referring to way down below. Because beneath our feet, way below, there is burning, fire, brimstone. And the easiest way, we were just talking about this before service, the easiest way to explain to people, you know, that hell is real, in my opinion, the easiest way, we have volcanoes. We know about volcanoes. What do they do? They shoot up fire and brimstone literally out of the earth, from below the earth. It's shooting up fire. Guess where it's coming from? It's coming from hell. <laughs> I mean, literally, there's a place called hell where souls go to be tortured. tortured. And, and that could be a whole other sermon. But Bible believers already should believe that concept, that hell is real. And it's a place of judgment. And that's where unsaved people go. Not the saved people, the unsaved people. Saved people have never gone to hell. And you never refer to someone, even if there were some good place, you would never call that place hell. I mean, talk about confusion. Why would you ever say, well, there's a good hell and there's a bad hell? Well, is there a good heaven and a bad heaven? No, there's not a good hell and a bad hell either. So look at verse number nine. It says, now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Turn to Acts chapter two. Acts chapter two is probably, this is what I'm out soul wondering if someone, I don't always go in depth on Jesus' soul going to hell. Sometimes I do. And if someone, a lot of people haven't heard that before, Acts chapter 2 is just the easiest place to turn to real quick and just show them, be like, oh, I never heard that before. Well, yeah, let me show you from Scripture where it says that. And the vast majority of the time, 99% of the time, we're just like, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't know that. But it makes sense. Why does it make sense? Because I explain, hey, where do you deserve to go for your sins? Hell. Okay, well, Jesus came to pay for our sins. Where do you think he went to pay for our sins? Hell. Case closed. Very easy concept. But the Bible teaches that very thing. Look at verse number 22. We're going to get this whole thing in context. Okay, I'm not going to rip this one out of context. Normally when I show people, I'll show them one verse that just says, this spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. I'll show them that verse and just say, hey, look, this is... But, but for the, the purpose of the sermon, I want to, I want to make sure that, that we're very clear on this. Let's get this passage in context. We're going to start reading in verse number 22 of Acts chapter 2. This is Peter preaching here. He says, "Ye men of Israel... Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So right now he's just given the real quick summary. This Jesus Christ, he was performing miracles among you. You guys with wicked hands took him, you killed him, you know, and, and um, you, you, you crucified him, you slain. He said, but this same Jesus, God raised him up, right? And he's just giving him this, this real quick summary. And now he's going to use the scripture to show the prophecy of that event. Again, just further to prove that he's the Christ. Because you took him, you killed him, but God raised him up from the dead. So he's going to quote Psalm 16, a portion of Psalm 16 to them, starting in verse number 25. For David speaketh concerning him. So when he's saying David speaketh, he's going to quote the Psalms because it's a Psalm of David in Psalm 16. David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see 
corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. And if you want to, we just exercise this. You could keep your place here in Acts chapter 2. If you want to make a note later, you could check Psalm 16. But I'm going to read for you the same passage in Psalm 16, just so you see this is the quote. And you could look along down at Acts chapter 2, and you could see that this is what he's talking about. So Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, is what he's quoting, what he's preaching here in Acts chapter 2. You could follow along. Start back up there, verse number 25, and I'm going to read, starting in verse number 8 of Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Is there any doubt that he was quoting Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11? None at all. That's exactly what he was quoting. Now he's going to give the application. He just got done saying, you guys killed Jesus. You crucified him with wicked hands. You killed him. But God raised him from the dead. He's giving them the story of the resurrection. And then he quotes Psalm 16, and now he's going to explain why Psalm 16 is so important. Verse number 25, for David, oh, excuse me, verse number 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. So he's saying, let me just tell you about David. David wasn't talking about himself. Amen. This is what he's saying. He's saying when, when, when Psalm 16 was written, when this is a Psalm of David, when David spake this, he wasn't speaking this of this happening to him, about his soul being left in hell, about, about his flesh not seeing corruption. He wasn't talking about himself because he says, you know what? David's dead and buried. We've got his grave here today. And it still has the bones of David in it. Verse 30, therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. So this is where he gets this, this passage he has quoted. It's in reference to the resurrection of Christ. That is the importance of it, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Do you need it spelled out any more than this passage does and what Peter does saying, it's Jesus' soul that Psalm 16 is talking about that was not left in hell. And in order for a soul not to be left in hell, it had to be in hell at some point to not be left there. This doesn't require very much thought or understanding to get that from the description, from the language. It uses the word hell. It doesn't use another reference to some other location. It doesn't say Abraham's bosom. It doesn't say this nice place. It doesn't say paradise. It says his soul was not left in hell. Now, also think about it this way. If you go to paradise... Are you going to be worried about being left in paradise? <laughs> like we're going to be like, oh man, thank God that he didn't leave me in paradise, you know, because I didn't want to just be left there. It wouldn't make any sense. But hell? <laughs> yeah, you better believe I don't want to be left in hell. I don't want to be there for a second. But yeah, his soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh see corruption? See, both of those aspects are important also. Why? Because his soul was separated from his flesh. His flesh was in the tomb and his soul was in hell. And that's why he's saying, look, this isn't talking about David. David's flesh did see corruption. David's flesh is rotting in its grave right now. But the flesh of Jesus Christ did not decay, did not rot while Jesus' soul was in hell. It was preserved. His soul was in hell, but it wasn't left in hell. 
he came back up, his soul rejoined his body, and he rose and walked out of his grave, walked out of that tomb, rose again from the dead. That's a big deal. And that's what Acts chapter 2 is teaching us, and Psalm 16 is teaching us. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Now, this is a solid piece of evidence that Jesus' soul was in hell. There is no reference of it being a good place. Look, if you just read the Bible and take it for what it says, it's pretty clear. But let's, let's just get some more teaching on it. Let's look at more Scripture. Why not? Why not just further establish what we believe with more Scripture? Because there's plenty of it to go around. Matthew 12, let me turn there myself because Jesus is, basically the Pharisees are asking Jesus for a sign. They're saying, well, you're the son of God. Well, we want to see a sign from you. As if, as if he wasn't doing enough signs anyways by healing people and, and you know, doing things that no one ever done before, casting out devils, doing, you know, we want to see a sign. Well, he answers them. Here, we're going to start reading in verse number 38. I don't have this in my notes. I just want to get there real quick. It says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So he's saying, You want a sign, but you're not going to get a sign. Here's, here's the only sign you're going to get. So he said, You are going to get a sign, but just, this is what it is. It is the sign of Jonas. And Jonas is just the, the New Testament way of saying Jonah. Verse number 40. What is that sign? For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And again, the heart. Where's the heart? The center. It's right in the middle. You have the heart, you have an avocado heart. Where does it come from? The middle, right? You know what's in the heart of the earth? Hell. Hell's in the heart of the earth. Let's turn to, turn to Jonah chapter 2 because Jesus is referencing Jonah as being the sign that he's going to give that basically he's the Christ that he's going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the sign. Well, what's really interesting about him bringing up Jonah as an example is that Jonah chapter 2 actually has a lot of prophecy in it. And just as when David was writing Psalm 16, it wasn't talking about him, well, we're going to see Jonah being a prophet in Jonah chapter 2. He wasn't just talking about his events when we read through Jonah chapter 2. Now, we are going to see some things in Jonah 2 that pertain to Jonah, but we're going to see some back and forth that clearly, with, without question, is not talking about Jonah. And especially with Jesus giving this reference of Jonah, it's a foreshadowing, it's a prophesying of Jesus spending three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Look at Jonah chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. So, he's in the whale's belly. This is a picture of Jesus Christ being in the heart of the earth. Because this is, this is what the whole prophecy is. It says in verse 2, And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Was Jonah in the belly of hell? No. He was in the belly of the whale. So when he's saying, out of the belly of hell cried I, it's the foreshadowing of Jesus being in hell. Jonah being a prophet, right? It makes sense. Verse number three. For thou hadst cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. This is talking about Jonah, right? Jonah was cast overboard. He's in the sea. Waves, billows, right? That's happening to him. Verse number four. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. 
The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. Again, this is talking about Jonah. But then look at verse number six. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Going down to the bottom of the mountains, that's going deep into the earth. Jonah did not go to the bottom of the mountains. And then on top of that, the earth with her bars was about me forever. And I don't care, you could, you could interpret, as far as I'm concerned, you could interpret that forever, meaning in time-wise, forever, like in eternity, or forever, meaning in every direction, kind of all over the place, because if you're in the center of the earth, you're going to have those bars around you everywhere, being locked up in hell forever. Either way, I mean, I think it could be both, but um, regardless, I'm not going to nitpick over that, but either way, this isn't talking about Jonah. Again, another prophecy of being in hell. Verse number seven, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord and the Lord spake unto the fish and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. That's Jonah chapter two. That is the entire time he spent in the whale's belly. Jesus Christ referenced that event talking about his death being dead for three days and three nights and referred to Jonah as being the sign. And Jonah talked about being in hell. And the earth with her bars was about me forever. Jesus Christ's soul was in hell. Not the good hell, because there is no good hell. For those three days and three nights that his body was dead in the earth, his soul was in hell. Turn to Exodus chapter 12. Again, something that I'm not going to prove is that Jesus Christ is known as the Passover lamb, as the lamb of God, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You, you have to be like a brand new babe in Christ that's never even heard the Bible preached before to not know that Jesus Christ is known as the Passover lamb and that the whole point of the Passover lamb in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus Christ to come in the future to be the lamb slain once for the sins of the whole world. I mean, yeah, we're, we're, I'm not even going to take the time to prove that this morning, this evening. I'm not going to do it. But let's look at what the Bible says about the Passover lamb. About that sacrifice that's made because that sacrifice is supposed to be pointing to Jesus Christ. Let's look at how many elements of this sacrifice match up perfectly with attributes of Jesus Christ. How about that he had to be without blemish? How about Jesus was sinlessly perfect? Let's keep reading. Let's, 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 let's read. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12, verse number 3. We'll see all the applications. But then you're going to tell me the part where it says it's roast with fire doesn't apply. Everything else applies, but that one doesn't. Let's read. Look at verse number 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. Now, if you follow along with this in the timeline, and we'll do this probably around Easter, the days match up for when Jesus was offered offered up his, his body as a sacrifice for our sins, even to the days that, that they're referencing for the Passover. Jesus was the Passover lamb that was killed on the day that the Passover lamb is supposed to be killed. It's, it's truly fascinating, and it truly is, just has the finger of God in all the prophecy, because there's no way that this is a coincidence that all of this that was written beforehand all came to pass so perfectly. It's amazing. It's incredible. But let's keep reading. 
It says, and you shall kill it, keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Wasn't the whole congregation of Israel saying, crucify him, crucify him. It wasn't just the rulers. It wasn't the Romans. It was the whole assembly saying, crucify him. Verse number seven, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Now, it, first of all, it says in verse number eight that, it, that the flesh, the meat of the, the lamb needs to be burnt with fire. But then in the next verse, it doesn't stop there. Because God, you know, whenever there's something reiterated or a lot of focus and attention on one point or one aspect, it usually means it's very important. When God takes the time to, to spell things out in detail and then to just really make sure that you understand what he's saying, as he's, we're going to see here in verse number nine, it's important. Now, when he said it was, uh, you know, people don't have a problem when he mentioned that it needs to be a uh, male without blemish, but then doesn't mention that again. Now, in other passages, he says, you know, it can't have any broken bones. It can't and it goes into further detail. You know why? Because that's also important. That is an important aspect of this prophecy, that it's without blemish, because the fact that Jesus Christ was sinless is very important. Because if Jesus had sin, how could he pay for our sins if he's got his own to pay for? That is an important aspect also. But this one, again, is, is also very important. Let's read this, verse number nine. Eat not of it raw. So raw would be not cooked at all. No fire. Nor sodden at all with water. You can't boil it. You can't treat it with water. No water involved. But roast with fire. His head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. All of it. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remain of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. You think there's a reason why God's stressing, hey, it needs to be burnt with fire. Roast it with fire. No water. You can't eat it raw. Roast with fire. Why? Because the lamb offering of Jesus Christ was roast with fire. Turn to Genesis chapter 22. Actually, no, turn to Revelation chapter 1. Genesis 22, this is, this is a minor point, but again, just, just more evidence nonetheless. Genesis 22, this is when uh, Abraham was going to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice. Genesis 22, 7 says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Amen. And that's exactly what he did. Jesus Christ was the lamb that was offered as a burnt offering. Don't forget the point, and we're going to drive home, I'm going to finish driving home this point. But the purpose of this is to give the, the honor and the credit and the respect to Jesus Christ for not only offering up his body and suffering reproach and doing all, everything that I mentioned this morning, but on top of all of that that he did, be willing to go to hell for us. Which, no matter what you go through in this life, I guarantee you, hell is way worse than anything you could suffer in this life. We know that there are people, and I'm going, I'm going to get a little ahead of myself, but that's fine, because I want to cover this right now. We know that there are people, there have been other martyrs throughout history that have suffered similar to what Christ suffered. The faith chapter in Hebrews 11 talks about this. I'll read it for you. 
Hebrews 11, 36, it says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. This is not talking about Jesus. Now, did Jesus have cruel mockings and scourgings? Yes, he did. And so did other people. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. I mean, people being cut in half. And not to take away from anything that Jesus did, his bone, we read about how horrible that was. But it's kind of hard to put those on, you know, like being cut. That's pretty bad too. I don't know which one I'd, I wouldn't want either of them, but it's pretty bad stuff. It says, we're tempted, we're slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. My point is that there are other people that have, that have gone through a lot of suffering in, the, in this world. But they're not our Savior. And even doing all of that wouldn't have been enough to pay the price for our sins. The fact that Jesus Christ went and suffered in hell is important for our salvation. It had to happen. It had to ha everything had to happen. And I don't want to minimize any aspect of what Jesus did for us, so don't take that the wrong way. But man can shed his blood. Man can be tortured on this earth. But no man went to hell and rose again to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ did that. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, for I am the first and the last. This is when John sees Jesus Christ. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. He has the keys of hell and death because... He conquered death and hell when he went to, to hell and then rose again from the dead. He has a victory over death and hell. And notice it says, I am he that liveth and was dead. The fact that he was dead is very important to say he was dead because it's not just talking about physically because physically doesn't really matter that much because when, if you remember when um, Jesus was talking about Abraham and Isaac, he said, God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Right? Abraham's considered alive. Is his body dead? Yeah, sure, but, but Jesus considered Abraham to be alive. He considered Isaac to be alive. God's a God of the, of the living, not of the dead. I might have said that backwards before. I just realized that now. I don't know. Hopefully I didn't. But... The fact that Jesus was dead is because he was dead in the, the, not just a physical sense of the word, but in every sense of the word. He was dead. The Bible refers to those, and you could turn there if you want. You're in Revelation chapter 1. We read this all the time. We go out soul winning, uh, or at least many of us do, if you use Revelation chapter 20, verses 14, 15, right at the end of the chapter there. Or right before that, it says... Right before the verse is right before that. Start in verse number 11. The Bible says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, it's referring to the dead being judged according to their works. Is that going to be a believer? No. We're not judged by our works. We're judged by whether or not we put our faith in Christ. Once you put your faith in Christ, that judgment is for us. So when it's talking about the dead, and if you have eternal life, guess what? You're not dead. The dead that's standing before God at the great white throne judgment, this is the judgment for all unbelievers. For all unbelievers. The judgment that believers have is the judgment seat of Christ. It's a wholly different event, completely separate from this event. 
The great white throne judgment of God is the unbelievers being cast into hell. They're going to be, and it says, the dead, small and great, are standing before God. They're, they're judged according to their works. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. The people in hell are dead, but they're still being delivered up. Now, our concept of, de of death, we were talking about this after the morning service too, was, um, you know, we think of death in the physical sense, well, your body's dead and it just lays there and doesn't do anything. Well, that's just your physical flesh. What about your soul? Your soul is still considered dead. Your spirit is considered dead, yet it's still active. It's still animated, if you will. It could still move and sense and, and, and experience and exist, not just, you know, I want to say it is lifeless because it's dead, but it's not the same way that we think of a, of a body being dead. That makes sense. Hopefully it does because it continues on because there's weeping, there's wailing, there's gnashing of teeth in hell among the dead. They're considered dead because they don't have life because they're in a place of death, but they still are conscious. They still exist in a state of being dead. And death and hell, you know, delivers up the dead that are in them. They're, ju they're, they're judged according to their works. And uh, death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And on and on. Um, let's turn real quick to Luke chapter 16. Because now I want to cover a few things. We've got a little bit of time, so I'll spend, I'm going to spend a little bit of time debunking. But I mean, I can go on and on. There's, st there's still more passages of Scripture. I tried to cover what I think are the main ones that just really knock out this doctrine pretty clearly. That just solidify, yes, Jesus' soul went to hell. I mean, the Passover lamb is a pretty significant piece of the puzzle here. It, it's a pretty significant portion of Scripture. <laughs> That, that is dedicated to the, the Passover lamb. Old Testament and New Testament. Acts chapter 2, Psalm 16. Pretty clear statements. Is you're going to have a hard time trying to twist that to mean something else than what it just very clearly says. But now we're going to cover this concept of Abraham's bosom, a place which is only referenced one time in the Bible. And it's referenced not as being a place in the afterlife, as opposed to if you were just to read, and what's funny is that I was never taught this before, and I thought it was actually just kind of comical that anyone believed this when I heard about it, because it's so far removed from what anybody would just naturally think when you're reading the Bible. I mean, you literally have to have this ingrained in your head to believe this to be true, that Abraham's bosom is actually a place in hell that... Old Testament saints would go to when they died. It's ludicrous. As opposed to actually just being a body part, like a bosom is. Like his chest, like embracing somebody into your bosom. Like is what, what, like is what exactly happens here with Lazarus. Let's read the story. Verse number 19 in Luke 16. The Bible says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, we're going to stop right here. What do we see in the story? Basically, you've got a beggar. He's living a really rough life. I mean, he's got dogs looking at sores. He's hungry. He's starving. He's begging for food. He's not having a very good existence on the earth, right? But he was saved. And then you've got the rich man. He's got great meals. He's got everything laid out for him. He's unsaved. He dies and goes to hell. Beggar goes to heaven, right? Now, how do we, first of all, how do we know he went to heaven? Well, <coughs> this passage doesn't specifically say heaven. But when you read all throughout Scripture, where do believers go 
you're going to have a hard time saying it's anywhere else. Like I said before, we see Old Testament references of people going, being caught up to heaven. And we see here just the fact that the angels carried him is what it says. So, um, Verse number 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. I'm trying to think of any reference. There's one reference where you have the, the angel that goes down to open up the pit, right, in Revelation. But when do you ever, ever in Scripture, other than that one place, hear of stories? Because there's stories, there's lots of stories of angels, right? Appearing unto man. If you're to read this story based on everything you've ever seen or read about angels in the Scripture, when they're going back and forth between being on this earth and being in the presence of God, where are they going? They're going up. Like every time, they're ascending up. When, Samson, when uh, Samson's parents, Manoah, was, is, you know, they're greeted by, by the angel. And, they, and they, leave, they make that sacrifice, right? And then what does he do? He goes up in the, in the smoke in the heaven, right? The angel meets him. So w all the time, the angels that, that God, Elijah, they carried him up into heaven by a whirlwind. We always see examples of angels going back up to heaven, to being in the presence of God. So when you read this story, and it says the angels carried him in Abraham's bosom, where are you going to naturally think they carried him to? To heaven. Because there's no reason to think otherwise. Because all the, the preponderance of evidence is, is showing us that's where you're going to go. And when it says they carried him into Abraham's bosom, well, wouldn't it make sense for a man who's had a really rough, rough life to be comforted when he enters into heaven. And when someone embraces you into their bosom, that's comforting. People oftentimes with theological degrees have a hard time understanding the most simple concepts that you could find in Scripture. This isn't in the Bible to confuse us or to teach some weird, bizarre Jewish fable or whatever, because, you know, it's the Jews that don't believe in hell anyways. And it wouldn't surprise me if this twisted perversion of, of this concept of, of having a good part of hell comes from them in one shape or form or another. Um, but we see here the Abraham, Abraham's bosom. He's carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. Rich man died. He goes to hell. Now, we know where hell is. Hell's not up. Never. Not one time in the Bible. Hell's down. He lifts up his eyes, being in torment, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, I don't care anywhere in Scripture, this is going to be a miraculous event of him being able to see the other because the Bible talks about you're separate. People who are in hell can't go into heaven. People who are in heaven can't go to hell. So, when there's a miraculous event, it doesn't have to be physically possible. Like, they don't have to be in, in physical proximity, like, real close to one another. You know what I'm saying? Because where people come up with this concept is that, oh, well, if they're having a conversation back and forth because you've got the rich man and Abraham having a conversation and he's talking to him out of hell, and, you know, then they must have been, they must be real close to each other. So this is just what they're thinking. But using that logic fails on every other test anyways through Scripture. And just the fact that they're able to... It's not like there's always been conversations going back and forth between people in heaven and people in hell. Just all throughout history. In the Old Testament, at least, until God transported things in heaven. And if that was... I mean, think about what a major event that would be. If Old Testament saints went to the heart of the earth... And then, at one point, they all ascended up into heaven with Jesus Christ. It sounds like a pretty major event. It sounds like something that the Bible would probably at least have some mention of, at least a reference one time. No, there is no reference to it. It's just an inference that people just throw in there and say, well, we know that people must have been in the heart of the earth 
I mean, Jesus' soul went to hell. We know that he must have, you know, no, you don't know that. You're just concluding that off of faulty logic. Let's finish the story here. It says in hell, uh, verse number 24, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from then. So they're saying, see a great gulf. A gulf is just like a valley. He said, no, a gulf is just some space in between. There is a great gulf. It doesn't have, they don't have to both be in the center of the earth to have a great gulf. You can have a great gulf between heaven and hell that exists right now. That is a great gulf. So this isn't, like you say, see, that proves it. Like, it doesn't prove anything. He's just saying there's a great distance between, and the fact that they're even having this conversation is a miracle. Why? Because it's in the Bible, because it's God's word, because God wanted to teach us something, so he allowed for this event to take place to teach us about hell and to teach us about all kinds of things. And I believe this is a real event that actually happened, not just a parable, because he uses the name Lazarus. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're almost done. 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to cover one more verse that I think people get confused about because these are the verses that they'll turn to to try to prop up their doctrines. And I don't want there to be any misunderstanding or confusion about this because there really shouldn't be. Now, there's nothing clear about Luke 16 referring to some other place other than, I mean, the rich man is in hell, right? That's clear. The, the beggar is not. Lazarus is not. Uh, but there's no, nothing clear that says that the two are next to each other in the same place or they're both called hell. That's the weirdest thing, is to call them, to refer to both of them as hell. That's the, that is the most weird thing because you never, see, even in this story, it says that the rich man was in hell. In hell, he lift up his eyes. It doesn't say Lazarus ever went to hell. Not one time. 1 Peter chapter 3 is a verse that I think a lot of people get uh, confused on our passage here. We're going to start reading verse number 17. The Bible says, For it is better if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing rather than for evil-doing. Uh, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water the like figure whereunto even baptism doth, doth also now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. And the problem with this passage is that people get taught one way of looking at it. And once you get taught that way, it's hard to think of it a different way. Uh, uh, there's many doctrines that have the same problem. When someone teaches you Calvinism, it's hard to see a verse another way than maybe what you've been ingrained to think of it as. And especially when it's a passage that the wording's a little funny, or it might not be the, the, the most easy to understand in the way that, that we speak today or whatever. Uh, these are the, the passages that seem to be the most troublesome and, and have the most uh, probability of being taught wrong. But let's look at this passage again, because what people say is that, well, Jesus went to hell. When Jesus died on the cross, what they'll say is he went to hell, yes, but he went there to preach to the people in hell. Now, that doesn't make any sense either. What would be the point of that? When someone has died and gone to hell, they can't get out of hell. They don't get another chance. This isn't, well, you've been in hell for a while, now I'm just going to come and preach to you. That's going to serve no purpose, first of all. It just doesn't even make any sense. But that's also not what the Bible's saying here. See, it doesn't say anything about hell. What it says is prison. First of all, a prison doesn't necessarily mean hell. 
it can, it can reference hell, but you can't just look at it and automatically swap prison for hell. Let's look at this passage again. Let's look at it. Let's read it a little bit slower. Verse number 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. So in this passage, it's saying, in verse 17, it says, It is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. So when you do bad, when you do wrong, you suffer for it. You're getting what you deserve. Okay? And if you take it patiently, well, okay, good. I mean, you should because you deserve it. And what he's teaching here is that, well, when you suffer for something you didn't do, you suffer wrongfully, but you take it well. You, you, you take it in stride. You, you take it as Jesus did, right? When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't deserve it, but he took it the right way. So the Bible's saying here, if you suffer for well-doing than for evil, it's better. So it's the will of God. So it's better that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. When you do good and you still suffer for it, that's better than suffering for evil-doing. For Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Because Christ also had to suffer for something he didn't do. He was the just one, and he suffered for the unjust, for the sinners, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. So he's put to death in the flesh, but made alive or quickened by the Spirit, the Spirit of God. That's brought him back up, okay? Now, when it says by the Spirit, colon, that's what we're, that's the subject of here in verse 19, by which also, by what? By the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So Jesus went and preached by the Spirit unto the spirits in prison prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited for Noah. Now, what's interesting about this too is that this gives us when he did this. Jesus preached unto the spirits in prison when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Why was God long suffering? Because he didn't bring the judgment yet. Noah was building the ark. So in the meantime, Jesus preached unto the spirits in prison before God's judgment came, giving more opportunity for people to get saved before the judgment came. While the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Noah's family was saved by, from the water that flooded the whole earth. The same spirit that quickened him allowed him to preach to the spirits in prison at that time when that happened, not thousands of years later when Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's not the same. The time frame doesn't match up. He wasn't preaching to spirits in hell when he died on the cross because this is happening during the days of Noah. That's when this, I mean, the, the scripture literally gives us when this happened. That's why it says, when once the long suffering of God waited in the, days, in the days of Noah. Not in the days of Jesus Christ, in the days of Noah. While the ark was a preparing, wherein few of those eight souls were saved. The like figure one, two. See, this is teaching something different than where Jesus' soul was when he died on the cross. That's not what it's referring to. So if you just take a. a Step by step and read through this, you can see very clearly what it's not talking about. It's not talking about his soul being in hell just to preach to some people in hell. Because that wouldn't even make any sense anyways. Turn to Mark chapter 12. It's the last place I'll be turned. We're done. I've got, uh, we've gone over quite a bit. This is, I've already referenced this passage in Mark chapter 12, but I'm just going to reiterate that we don't want to cheapen what Jesus did for us. Jesus lived the perfect life. Let's not cheapen that. That's hard enough as it is. We know that, making all the right choices all the time. Let's not cheapen, hey, 
He was sinless. He was perfect. He did no sin. Amen. Praise God for that. That's awesome. He endured and suffered and, and, and went through the temptations and came out perfect. Jesus endured the shame of the cross, being the son of God, knowing he was who he was and having people mock him and ridicule him and hang him up with, 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 other, with, with sinners, with transgressors, with you know, wicked people. He was numbered with them as if he was just like them. Not even close. He took the sins of the world voluntarily took our sins. He was forsaken of his own father. He was left. I mean, think about the, the rejection, the feeling of rejection from his own people who said, crucify him, kill him. He comes to help his people. He comes to heal his people. And they say, kill him. And they nail him to a cross. And now, not only did they all reject him, but then he's got, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? Why? Because he is bearing the sins of the whole world. And he needed to be forsaken, again, as part of everything that needed to be done. That alone wasn't enough, but you can't forget that either. Jesus was rejected and forsaken of all. Don't forget that. He went through that. Imagine being forsaken by your entire family and by everyone around you, and everyone hates you. And just being left to die or being publicly mocked and ridiculed. Jesus did that for you. And after all of that, he went to hell. His soul descended into hell. But thank God he didn't remain in hell. The Bible says in Mark 12, 26, and is touching the dead that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You therefore do greatly err. Jesus Christ, resurrection from the dead. He's the God of the living. And we want to thank God for that resurrection. Jesus, yes, he was dead. No doubt about it. Every sense of the word. Jesus deserves, with every ounce of our being, gratitude and respect and love and honor and glory. And he has a name, rightfully so, above every name. At the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow and every tongue that sh shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's not forget that, that sacrifice, the gift, the giving, the giving of self this year when, you know, during Christmas. When you go home and spend time with family and friends, think about that, reflect on that and, and let that help guide you and guide your path and, and man, just motivate you even more to share that love with other people. Some people are going to call me a heretic for believing this. They'll say, Jesus didn't go to hell. You're blasphemous. I can't believe you would say that. I don't see, I, I, I can't get any other thing out of the scripture. I think we looked at plenty of scripture tonight to prove it, one, you know, up one side and down the other. It's pretty clear. I'm just going to believe what the Bible says and you call me whatever you want to call me, but this is a doctrine that I, I will not change and I will not back down on because it is just too clear. I am settled on this and hopefully our church is settled on this because it actually it is a very important doctrine. It is a very important doctrine. It's one that's kind of gone by the wayside. And um, hopefully this clears up any confusion that there might have been out there regarding the subject. But let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you've done for us, Lord, for all of the the pain and the, and the sacrifice and everything that you've endured just for us, just for us sinners, Lord. It, it is humbling beyond words 
that, that you would do something so special for us, dear Lord, and even just to face, I, I can't even imagine, the thought of hell is, is terrifying, Lord, and we thank you so much for, for making it possible for us to spend an eternity with you without the fear of, of reprisals for, for our sinful flesh and the, and the acts that we've done in, in our flesh here, dear Lord, but that we could spend an eternity with you in, uh, in joy and happiness, dear Lord, and we thank you for, for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name we pray.